Hi, and welcome to this introduction to link budgets. The term link budget refers to an analysis of a radio link in terms of the freeze transmission equation. Typically, a link budget is presented as a table of factors, maybe as a spreadsheet, where values are expressed in decibels. This makes the impact of individual factors easy to see, and so usually serves to simplify the process of radio link planning and analysis. Here's what we'll cover in this lesson. First, we'll convert the free space freeze equation into decibel form. Then we'll use this form of the equation to construct a simple link budget. Along the way, we'll encounter the concept of link margin, which is a handy way to think of the reliability of a radio link. Finally, I'll say some things about what happens in practical link budgets, which are based on expanded forms of the freeze transmission equation and account for things like more complicated path loss conditions, fading, uh, receiver parameters such as noise figure, and so on. The starting point is the freeze transmission equation in free space, and here it is. The equation says that the received power, P sub R, equals transmit power, P sub T, times transmit antenna gain, G sub T, divided by path loss, L sub P naught and then times the receive antenna gain, g sub r. The path loss L sub p naught is equal to 4 pi times distance, r, divided by wavelength, lambda, that quantity squared. So here's what we're going to do. First, we're simply going to take 10 times log base 10 of each side of the equation. So now both sides of the equation will be in decibel type units. The logarithm of a product is equal to the sum of the logarithms of the factors. So all we're doing here is using that principle to separate each factor in the equation into a separate term. Now take a moment to note the minus sign in front of the path loss term. That minus sign appears because L sub P naught appears in the denominator of the freeze equation. Once again, this is just following the rules of logarithms. Now, each of these terms is separately in decimal type units. So let's call each one of those out. If P sub T was in watts, then it'll now be in dBW, that is decibels relative to one watt. P sub R, similarly, will be in dBW. Of course, the antenna gains will be in dBI, that is decibels relative to isotropic. And path loss is unitless, so now it'll just be in plain old decibels. Now we're ready to construct a link budget. All we're going to do is line up each of the terms from the previous equation in a column, just as if we were analyzing a financial transaction using a spreadsheet. The sum of the first five rows, being the factors on the right of the freeze equation, are added to obtain the received power. Now at this point, it's useful to consider an example, so let's do that. I'm going to consider a hypothetical land mobile radio system operating at 4.9 GHz. For what it's worth, 4.9 GHz is a bona fide frequency band for such systems, and so this could in principle be a real system. Now, we're set up to study free space propagation. That's probably no problem as long as all the antennas are high up above the ground and the terrain is relatively flat and there is negligible multipath from terrain and buildings. So, for example, maybe we have in mind a transmitter on a high tower, and uh, maybe the receivers are handsets held by users, and maybe those users are in helicopters. In that case, free space might not be a bad assumption. And in any event, we can make refinements later if necessary. In this example, we'll say the transmit power is 4 watts, as shown in the table. We'll assume the transmit antenna is a vertically oriented dipole which gives us an omnidirectional pattern in azimuth. For path loss, we need to know wavelength and distance. The frequency is 4.9 gigahertz, so the wavelength will be about 6.1 centimeters. For range, we're going to assume 27.5 kilometers. So, we're assuming that our helicopter riding receivers are well above the radio horizon at this distance. Finally, the receive antennas. Those are handsets, and that's all we know. Okay, now we have to translate all this information into the corresponding values in decibel type units. For transmit power, we just take 10 log 10 of 4 
which is 6.0 dBW. For what we're doing here, one-tenth of one dB precision is plenty fine. So no need to say 6.02 dBW, for example. 6.0 dBW is fine. Now, the dipole. The directivity of a dipole is 1.64 in linear units, which is 2.1 dBi. We have no information about the efficiency of this dipole. However, we've noted in previous lessons that dipoles can be very efficient. So for now, we'll assume the efficiency is 1, that is 100%. Again, this might be something we want to revisit later, but this value is okay to get started. So, we have entered plus 2.1 dBi for the gain of the transmit antenna. Path loss is computed using the usual equation shown in the upper right of this slide. We get L sub P naught equals 3.19 times 10 to the 13th in linear units, which is plus 135.0 dB. Now, remember, we're dividing by path loss in the freeze equation, so we tack on a minus sign for this entry. For handsets, the antenna gain is very difficult to know, and it might depend on dynamic factors, including how the handheld is oriented relative to the transmit antenna. We do know that the maximum efficiency of the antennas used in this kind of application might be 5 dBi or more, but we also know that the efficiency of these antennas tends to be poor. But we need to start somewhere, so we'll start by assuming 0 dBi for the receive antenna gain. Now, we don't need to believe this forever. When we're done with the link budget, we could come back later and try higher and lower values. But for now, just know that 0 dBi is a plausible value, but it may need to be revisited. Okay, now, to get the received power, all we need to do is add up the terms. We get minus 126.9, and the units are dBW. Done. Well, not quite. If this calculation was all we wanted to do, then there really wouldn't be much advantage doing it this way over just fiddling around with the original equation. The utility of a proper link budget is in facilitating analysis and design in a convenient way, and in particular, clearly seeing how different factors affect overall performance. To demonstrate this, Let's continue with our example. Now, what will often happen in practical work is that you end up with a specification on the minimum received power. So let's consider that. I've added this constraint to the design. Namely, the received power can be no less than minus 100 dBm. That's decibels relative to a milliwatt, which is how received power is often measured. What we're now saying is that we consider the link to be okay if the received power is at least this much. In common lingo, we might say that we require minus 100 dBm to close the link. So, how are we doing relative to this requirement? To answer that, we need our calculated received power in dBm. No problem. dBm is simply dBw plus 30. That is, 1 watt is 1,000 milliwatts, and 1,000 is 30 dB. So, values in dBm are 30 dB greater than values expressed in dBw. So, our received power is minus 126.9 plus 30, which is minus 96.9 dBm, as shown here. Comparing minus 96.9 dBm to minus 100 dBm, we see that we have met the requirement. We say that the link is closed. In this business, it's common to define a link margin. In this example, link margin is defined to be the actual received power relative to the required received power. So, in this case, the link margin is minus 96.9 dBm minus minus 100 dBm, which is plus 3.1 dB. Since the link margin is greater than 0 dB, the link is closed. If the link margin had been less than 0 dB, then the link would not be closed, suggesting that we might not be able to operate on this link. The degree to which the link margin is greater than 0 dB is an indication of reliability. For example, if the link margin were 20 dB and there was no factor 
that was likely to be less than the computed value by 20 dB, then we would feel pretty confident that the link will remain closed even if one of our calculations turns out to be optimistic. In other words, greater link margin means greater reliability. In our example, recall that we were uncertain about the receive antenna gain and decided just to assign a preliminary value of 0 dBi. But now we see that the resulting link margin is just 3.1 dB. How confident are we that the receive antenna gain might not be lower than we expected, say, minus 4 dBi? That's totally plausible in this scenario, and if it turned out to be the case, then our link would not be closed. In other words, this analysis reveals a link which satisfies the received power requirement, but may not be sufficiently reliable. If you really want to make sure this link remains closed, regardless of the actual value of the antenna gain, then you should probably redesign the system to achieve a significantly greater link margin, maybe 10 dB or 20 dB, depending on how reliable the link needs to be. And now you see that we have an easy way to redesign and quickly reevaluate the system. For example, if you decide to increase the link margin by 10 dB, then you just need to find something that can be increased by 10 dB. In this example, you could increase transmit power by 10 dB. Or you could increase the transmit antenna gain by 10 dB. Or you could increase some combination of the two for a total of 10 dB improvement. Now, what I've shown you is obviously a very simple example but hopefully you can see how this kind of thinking is useful in the analysis and design of radio links. The utility of this approach becomes even more apparent as a scenario becomes more complicated. For sure, many, perhaps most, practical problems are not well modeled as happening in free space conditions. Then, the path loss expressions can become very complex. You may end up with multiple breakpoint distances, multiple path loss exponents, multipath that causes large variations in path loss over short distances, we call that fading, and so on. You might want to explicitly consider antenna efficiency and cross-polarization losses. You might want to include receiver parameters, such as noise figure, in this analysis, and you might want to see explicitly the effect on the pre-detection signal-to-noise ratio. If so, this is all easily accommodated in the link budget framework. In addition, there are methods for analysis of bottom line sensitivity, accounting for things like demodulator performance. For sure, this approach is not limited to just received power or pre-detection signal-to-noise ratio. If you're interested in examples of practical link budgets, which include these elements, take a look at the textbook cited at the bottom of this page, which shows link budgets for a variety of practical radio systems. So, wrapping up. We've learned that a link budget is a convenient way to assess link performance and has the nice feature that it makes it clear what the relative impact of various design elements are and which aspects of a link can be further optimized. And we've also learned some new lingo, including the concepts of link closure and link margin. That concludes this introduction to link budgets. Thanks for listening.